G'day guys and welcome to the Centre Bounce where today we'll be talking about the Battle of the Bridge between the Swans and the Giants. Stay tuned. Yes, Big J, it was a great game that we saw one among three. We're going to be pumping out all three reviews tonight, but it was an entertaining game where the Swans managed to get the better of the Giants 16 16 112 defeating the giants 13 8 86 what did you think about this game man um just to kind of start things off it really there were a lot of players who were crucial to both teams that didn't play like taylor adams didn't play for sydney there was a few other guys there gw west did lose a few other players into including tom uh, toby green um and then taylor and then um, buckley played in the back line so that that was good for them but um, yeah, it was a very scrappy game. Playing on a smaller ground, uh, you know how things are a little bit more contested and congested than maybe somewhere like the MCG where players can run around a lot. But the good thing about this game was because there were so many players who were out, it really allowed us to see a lot from the younger kids, which I think in Supercoach Trust is obviously a, a really good thing. We know some of times who, which of the, the more experienced premium level players can play. But out of this game, even for maybe one team more than the other team, there were definitely some players that we need to watch over the next couple of games. And the beautiful thing is about GWS for Sydney, we can take what we know now and apply it to the next two games because they have round zero. Correct, exactly. Having having round zero is a massive benefit when it comes to looking at these players, and especially the ones that didn't play today, exactly as you mentioned, like a Taylor Adams, for example, who I know some people are really interested in including in their Supercoach sides. He's moved mm. across from the Pies to the Swans, not to play an outside role. You'd imagine that this recruit is going to be playing a lot on the ball, and we've seen historically when he does play that role, he's scored really well so could be a top six forward and i'm sure a lot of people are keen to see how he goes about it but i mean it seems like from this game the swans were pretty comfortably on top of the giants they've had what 32 scoring shots to 21 um yeah. did, did it feel like it was a real strong performance by the swans are they a, are they the real deal you think coming into this year i think some of the things that probably hindered them a little bit last year. They definitely worked on this year. We know how strong a Goulden, how strong a Chad Warner and those other players are, um, and the goals that they can kick through that position as well. But a lot of the smalls and the mediums and even like Logan McDonald kicking four, like it's things that we haven't necessarily seen as much of, and that kind of is why that they scored a lot more than what GWS did. Um, GWS, uh, Hogan kicked four, Cadman kicked four. We'll talk about them in the GWS part, but... Like, it was really those two and then, like, one or two goals versus everyone else versus Sydney that was spread out a little bit more. And when that happens in a team, it becomes a lot harder to actually defend against. And that, to me, is a really positive sign and, I guess, an indication that the Swans really are taking that next step to really be a, a genuine threat. Now that they've gone past Buddy, Lance, mm. Buddy Franklin, one of the greatest players to ever play the game. Some A lot might uh, successfully argue that the greatest forward that they've ever seen, the greatest forward of all time, he's out of that. And when you lose someone like that from your team, it's always been a question mark, like who's going to be the next player? Who's, who's going to step up? How are they going to find their goals? And they've mm -hmm. found a lot of different avenues. They've clearly spread the love. And for them to go 16-16 just goes to show that they've really improved on higher up the ground with some of their acquisitions, like a Grundy, for example, to help get the ball forward more. And we're going to talk about their, play, their more specific players in a bit. Uh, but all in all, just from a general perspective, it seems like the Swans are really excited to, to hit the ground running, as I'm sure people are going to see in your video that you did with Riles Macca coming out. So um, people are going to get around it. Make sure you subscribe and hit, hit the notification bell to make sure you don't miss that epic video yeah it's going to be definitely a good one just having one of those fans that's obviously very knowledgeable um on the show talking about the team they love it's always the best thing uh definitely talking about kind of not being in the buddy franklin era as well it's kind of this game they had a couple of players who they brought in during the trade period so grundy was playing james jordan was playing and being able to mold the team around those players as well and actually show us hey 
when the rest of the team is fit, where are they going to play? Are they going to dominate? That kind of thing it was really good for us today. Sydney definitely, I think, you know, what was it, 2022? They had the grand final loss. Last year, they just made finals but then got kicked out. They kind of know where the holes are in the team and they're slowly trying to, like, neutralise those and build on their strengths as well. Yep, exactly. But we will now move on specifically in relation to some specific players and we'll start off today, we'll change it up, we'll start off with the losing side, the GWS Giants. And right off the yeah. bat, we've got Lockie Whitfield uh, playing his half-back role that mm-hmm. we sort of were, where he's played his best football in the past. Yeah, unfortunately, as I said at the start, they did play at a smaller ground, so there wasn't a lot of half-back. When you're not taking kickouts, you can basically sneeze and get the ball from the, the defensive goals to the, you know, the midfield. Um, so there wasn't that much of that, but he did take some kickouts and things as well, which was good to see. It's just going to depend, you know, after the next game and whatnot, what actually happens with his game. GWS did have a couple of players not playing. I'm not sure where Kennedy, where Nick Haynes, Perryman coming as well um, are going to play. So maybe that affects a little bit of their back line and, and players who might rotate through there as well as the midfield. So, yeah, big watch and see. Not in my team at the moment, not even thinking about him, but just wanted to put him on the list as you know, someone who could be a player for us. Especially with the early buy, that obviously yeah. makes it really difficult. I know there is a premium midfielder that we're going to talk about in a second who, you know, if not for the buy, I'm sure a lot more people would be owning him. But Lockie Whitfield playing that halfback role, the orange tsunami. With this guy, Lockie Ash, who also managed to get his hands on the ball quite a bit, I think. He also mm-hmm. had some kick-ins and, you know, at times people like, wait, who's who's that? What number was it? Who's number seven? Oh, it's Lockie Ash. Um, yeah. I know our good friend Hippo uh, from Hippo Supercoats had a love-hate relationship with this guy last year, but he definitely looked the goods, I think, this um, in today's game. Yeah, um, similar to a Whitfield, I think he was playing half back, did take some kick ins and things like that, as you were saying. So, not really super coach relevant, but at least we know where he's playing and helped out with the makeup a little bit of some other players. Yeah, I know some people were talking about this guy and were thinking, oh, he's going to be playing at half back. It's, it's cemented no. there. He could be a top six, could he be a top eight? I, I didn't see it today, man. No, I, I, I to be honest, I actually just looked for him in the injury list to be like, was Himmelberg injured? Because I did not. I think maybe because he cut his hair or something happened. He might have just been stuck on key defender duties because I, I legitimately didn't see him. And maybe I heard the commentators like call his name, but potentially not. Like, he, he just was absent. Um, gone was his intercepting domination. And it's a bit of a sad one as well because uh, the Swans were bombing it long to some of their key calls at times and it would have been fantastic to see it happen so maybe in the next two games we'll see something but today no thanks definitely saw a lot more from this next kid Lee Galeer definitely was very eye-catching yes. uh, I thought I thought he was very impressive did himself no fav- uh, no harms whatsoever in terms of playing I think getting a senior call up um, very highly rated He's got a bit of anger to him whenever he gets a ball on the mark. He likes to give a little push on the guy Mm -hmm. on the mark, like, piss off, I beat you. This is my ball now. So um, I I like that. I like people with a hard edge to him, with a hard streak, and he was great overhead, did some great defending work, and I love it that he's a basement, that he's a rookie price player as well. So do you reckon this guy could perhaps get a a call up? Oh, mate, I reckon he's like, we'll we'll see what happens in the next game, but come round zero if Alika Lear plays, and we're missing out on defenders in Supercoach, he could slot in. Um, he looked good. And I know there were some glimpses in, in games last year and whatnot, or at least in the practice games when I've seen him. Um, he hasn't looked like he's been there. Like he, he's in the team, but maybe not the game sense, that kind of thing. Feels like he's actually worked on that a little bit in today's game. We saw that coming through. And yeah, Lee Clear, 123K, doing intercepts and a little key defender work. Like, Get in my team if everything works out okay. Yeah, he looks ready to play, um, yeah. as does this guy. He looks ready to to tear people apart. Mate, mate, Tom Green just came in and was just like, hey, I'm Tom Green, that's it. Like, watch out, especially against a depleted Sydney team where contested game is not their strong suit. Like, speaking to Riles Macker about it as well, it's like, 
after since Kennedy's left, like contested games just not our work, and that's why they brought in Adams. That's why they tried to bring in James Jordan. Why they have had Sheldrick and some others come through is just because they they need that. Um, Tom Green was pushing people out of the way. There were some good highlights on Twitter of him just like holding a player back and be like, "Hey, mate, threw him on the ground." You know, what can you do? It's Tom Green. Hulk, he Hulk smashed. Uh, yes. I forgot who it was. Yes. Was it McInerney or something? Like trying yes, to, you know, like, it was McInerney. Yep. Like, please, mate, please. Like, I understand. I like the effort, but come on, mate. This is Tom the Tom the lean mean fighting machine. I don't know, bro. You, you got to awesome. like gank him with two people just to um to, to do anything. Correct. Uh, I thought Cornelio had a decent game, again, bopping up in the middle of the ground. He doesn't have that forward eligibility anymore, which really sucks, um, mm. which I think really takes him out of consideration. Um, I think he's I think he's one that likes to beat up on weaker teams. Yes. And um, yeah. when things are tough against strong opposition, he, he definitely shines a lot less. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's, considering he's got you guys in West Coast in rounds one and two, perhaps he might shine there, but I didn't see him shine bright today. <laughs> Yeah, I think in Supercoach, not being forward eligible really hurts him quite a lot because he was just like, cool, setting up goals and doing some stuff in that midfield. But at that price, there's definitely better players. And as you say, maybe he's going to get a cheeky 200 against North Melbourne round one and like, oh, get in my team, Cornelio. But outside of that, it, it was, I didn't feel like I couldn't see him on the field, but he wasn't dominating is what I'm going to say. And same with yeah. Josh Kelly as well. Like, they were there. They were just doing the motions and things like that. But it wasn't like Josh Kelly season during this game. And I think maybe the smaller ground, not being able to just run and dominate as much might have affected that a little bit. Yeah, because Jelly is more of an outside run player, likes to break some lines and really use the width of the ground and things like that. So, of mm-hmm. course, in a, in, a, in a smaller ground, that is understandable. Plus, it was their first head out. And as you mentioned right off the top, it was a very scrappy affair, and that's going to be the case for the other two reviews that we do. All all the games today were very scrappy. Um, yes. But this guy wasn't. This guy wasn't scrappy at all. I really like the look of his kit. He he definitely worked hard, um, higher up the ground, would push inside 50, kick the goal as well, great pressure work. Um, I honestly thought this guy really played well in that wing, like half forward role sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I think he's passing under the radar. There's a bunch of injuries uh, at at the Giants on the wing, and this guy could really be taking a claim for that spot. Well, that's it, right? They, as I said at the start, yeah, GWS has a few players who could sneak in, and we spoke about what two of them, and there's two in the forward line as well who are eligible. So Jacob Weir, I think a couple of years ago, he was around the mark and a rookie for us to select, but got relegated back to the, the, to the VFL, and... Yeah, looked good, was running up and down the ground alongside another guy who we'll talk about soon and looked like he could play. And I know our forward line, sorry, our midfield rookie stocks on the field are decent, you know, Sanders, McKercher, that kind of thing, but the the ones on the bench aren't that great. So if, like, someone got injured, you can throw him in there, Joe. Like, hey, um, the early buy is really the only thing that hurts him. Yeah, I mean, you did allude to someone that he was that he was running past, that r- running really well with. I guess we can talk about them now. Um, yep. This guy, go take take it take oh, it away. I love this kid, Joe. I, we, we we watched the um watched the preview or the game before like doing this preview again, doing the review, and Harvey Thomas was just doing like cool things. Um, I think he's decently tall, around like the one ninety mark, but he's Giants Academy player, so they know what they're going to get out of him and. They were very, very lucky to get him, you know, a pick 50-odd and to come in and basically be a lock to play. Um, did very well. Was used as a high half forward, a transition player across the ground. And you could see it. He was setting up goals, doing crazy things, even pushed to, like, the half back line a little bit and was that guy that ran the ball through the wing. There's a spot for him in that team. And I think now is the time that they know what they're going to get. So it's, hey, can you play it versus grown players or do we need to send you back to the to the reserves and actually, like, get you to train through there. I think he looked really good. Mate, fingers crossed. If we can get a 117K, another mid-forward 117K, we've got, obviously, Sean Manor, who we're going to talk about in the Geelong game. Yeah. Obviously, we've got someone like a Cooper Simpson uh, from Fremantle as well. So we can add another yeah. mid-forward 117K to the mix. Uh, 
moving to the ruck line, we got big Kieran Briggs uh, mm -hmm. in the ruck, the only one really worth talking about from the Giants. And it wasn't looking great in the first quarter. It looked like Brody Grundy was well and truly all over him. But I think Briggsy sort of worked his way into the game, wasn't getting as dominated as he was at the start, definitely started to, to get involved in the play, hold his own in the center bounces, get some free kicks as well from um, win some free kicks because I think, you know, man, Grundy, we're going to talk about him, but it looked like he really had a point to prove and it was really coming out to play hard and Briggs managed to get a couple of free kicks as well because of that aggression. But so I look, he was, he did a decent was solid, but I'm not starting him for super coach, not for that price and not with that early buy. No, definitely not. Maybe in like draft or something like that, you can pick him up. I know when I was doing my team previews, there was a few, few of the Ruckman who cool. You could do that and things like that, but it, um, yeah. Briggs was good. Did kind of show a little bit of where Grundy may need some help during the preseason. Um, being that stronger player, Briggs is like, he came through the, the reserves last year. And obviously we know the story of him playing like, you know, our super coach teams, 200K, whatever. But he's quite big and he's quite strong. He's not as mobile, but he is big and strong. And Grundy was... Pushed, not pushed around, but it was kind of pushed around in the early parts of the game. Um, Briggs tapered off a little bit towards the end, but yeah, he, he did all right for Ruckman, um, just not really super coach relevant. The new rule about being just being able to push your hand, to stick your hand out, definitely works in Briggs' favour. Yeah. Uh, mate, this guy kicked a few goals today, didn't he? Jesse Hogan is the biggest tease in super coach. It is the worst thing ever. If Jesse Hogan in the next two games does like a four and then like a five against their round one opponents, I'm not going to be excused for bringing him into my team because he no. looked good. Like Jesse Hogan looked like what he was at Melbourne before all the drama happened, being that type of player. And they're looking for him on field. They, they're actively like, this is our key forward. This is what yeah. we're doing alongside Cadman, who we'll talk about next. And he just looked good. Um, they have a really early buy. Sorry, they, they have good players to beat up on early um, before their buy, like North Melbourne and West Coast, who don't have the best defences at the moment. So being able to pick a player like him, potentially he jumps up to like what, 520K-ish early. And it's those differentials in scores as well. Like a lot of people are running mid-prices. If you've got Jesse Hogan in there and he does like a 110-110, that could be 50 points plus that you've got on someone else per week. Um, who, who might be playing a slightly cheaper player. So definitely someone to watch over the next couple of games. But their forward line was literally kick it to Hogan, kick it to Cadman as our two key forwards. And then yeah. the rest of the smalls, like orange tsunami, crumb around. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's not someone that you're looking to keep for the whole year. No. He's a key forward that you're hoping to really jump on very early on, seeing that he's going to get a big price rise um, based on favourable matchups. I know Nick, La I know Nick Larkey... Kicked, some, kicked a few goals against Collingwood in that practice game. Now, of course, I'm not comparing Hogan to Larky. Larky is uh, uh, is an amazing forward. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, so, but still, like, if Hogan can, if Hogan can kick, like, three or four goals against Collingwood and then all of a sudden is lining up against North Melbourne and West Coast in, in the two yeah. weeks to come, it becomes like, mm -hmm. holy crap, if you can it's kick exciting. three or four against yeah. Collingwood, the, the premiers, what's he going to do against these teams? And as you he's the key, he's the number one. So I'll, I've jokingly said it on a bunch of other platforms in the past. Oh, it's Jesse Hogan season. Get around him. But um, it really it could, could be. be. Jesse Hogan season. Yeah. <laughs> it could be Jesse Hogan season. Um, oh, and Cadman so did himself, so, and Cadman did himself um, as well a, a good service as well. Uh, he's got that lean strength about him. So he's able mm -hmm. to run and present and um, harass that ground level, which I thought was really good for a key forward um, mm -hmm. of his size. And obviously he wasn't the main target, Hogan was, but I thought Cadman showed enough to really warrant a sneaky selection on your bench. Again, talking about if he can kick, if he can kick a couple of goals against Collingwood yeah. and look good again, then you might be thinking maybe he could kick three or four against North or maybe he could kick three or four, maybe even five against uh, against the Eagles who are, yeah. who are a, a basket case. So, you know, he's he's a sneaky one for the bench, I reckon. Yeah, I think so as well. Uh, depending on who we get kind of presented to us in the round zero games, and 
who are you confident in picking for round one? Obviously, when Supercoach opens, he he's definitely like, hey, look at me, and he's just signed a, a four year extension, so now he's signed for six years at GWS. Because some teams were looking at him, especially some of the Melbourne teams, um, they they got to play, and they're going to play him every week as long as he's fit. So we're not talking yeah. going to get to four hundred k, but with a good few games, kicking some goals, I reckon I could see a 70-plus average out of him. And that's all we need in Supercoach. Like, it, it's fairly doable. A couple of goals a game, some contested marks, maybe a handball or two or in a tackle in the forward line. Like, it's not too hard if you've got a set position on field every week. Exactly. And with that, we'll now move across to the Sydney Swans players. Stay tuned. And now we're going to look at all the good Sydney Swans players who maybe or maybe not you should have in your super coach. Gee, that was a little bit, okay. that was very delayed. That was a very delayed movement there. But we start Sorry. off with, Sorry. We, we start off with Jake Lloyd, the Seagull, uh, yeah. doing, doing Seagull things. It's yeah. what, um, what you expected of Lloyd. You continue to see more of it, I think. Yeah, it, it's... It's an interesting one with Jake Lloyd in the back line because a couple of years ago, obviously, he was very super coach relevant, but has definitely fallen off. And I think you're only going to see, like, the 95 average. Like, mm-hmm. Lakey would have to be injured. Campbell and a few others, like, potentially would have to go from that back line. Half the team who are playing in that position now would have to go for him to be really more. Like, in draft, sure, Jake Lloyd, 100% go for him with, like, a late pick. But in super coach, not really relevant here. No, he's not relevant. As you mentioned, it's because the the emergence of this guy. Um, yes. I know there was reports uh, a couple of years ago that Lloyd might be moving across the Gold Coast Suns and that Blakey was going to be the main man. If that actually happened, Nick Blakey would be in my side with the first person yeah. in my team. He yeah, would be the first person in my team because I love the way that the lizard goes about it, and he was sensational. Um, again, they love to have the ball in his hands. They love him to run and gun, and he had this one passage of play where he literally kicked the goal, having run the ball from one end of the ground to the other. Um, it was incredible. I, I love the lizard, Blakey. It is a very awkward price, though. He's 500K. 500K. You're picking him to be a keeper. Um, yeah. But as long as Lloyd's around, then I can't see him being a keeper. Well, that's it, right? Like draft and things like that. And, you know, maybe if you're super desperate, that's what's going to happen. But, yeah, just just it's a no from me. Yeah. Uh, what are you thinking of Brandon Campbell today? Um, he was. It seemed like he'd been in a different role. Like last year we had seen a lot of him through the back line kind of trying to be that halfback player, things like that. But it definitely seemed like today they were trying to actually run him through the forward line. So he played almost like a, a pseudo small forward type role because his kicking is quite good. So being able to set up players and things like that, he's really accurate, maybe not the fastest player, but really good ball skills. So being able to translate that into a forward role has worked out quite well for him. And I think it's felt like in past, maybe Swans fans will let us know, but like he's been on the fringe of the best 22 every week. So will be able to come in to lock that role and potentially allow Papley or someone else to actually play like midfield or rotate through those positions definitely helps his his cause to be played every week. So we might get Braden Campbell, triple DPP, like <laughs> triple P, defender, midfielder, and now forward. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that. That was a joke. No, that, yeah. won't, that pretty... won't happen. Yeah. But I thought he did. I also th- saw some glimpses of where he was, I suppose, kicking the ball inside 50 as well, yes. um, yeah. which I thought, Based on the preseason reports, that might have been something that Roberts might might, might be doing himself. Yeah. But um, for me, it just I I didn't like the look of it. To be honest, I just think Matty Roberts, the role that he played today, wasn't quite what we were hoping that he would have, considering what we heard in the preseason. And because of that, I'm not sure that this guy is going to be best 22. He's got other players well and truly ahead of him, um, and. I, I feel that he really could be a sub risk, to be honest. Yeah, I think so as well. And it looked at times like he just wasn't as fit as what he probably should be to play the position. So maybe something happens, and then for the next two games, it comes out and he actually is locked in. And you know, we can keep him at one fifty six k, playing that half back role that you know all all the fans have been talking about him like playing and preseason reports and whatnot. But yeah, at the moment, he's 
he, he's on the get out of my team list. <laughs> what about this guy? This guy should be on the opposite list, right? Oh, if Errol Goulden didn't have the early buy, Joe, he would be in so many calculations. He just did whatever yeah. Errol Goulden wanted to. Like Tom Green did that for GWS, but Errol Goulden's a much faster player, so he can run away from Tom Green. Um, and I think he did that a couple of times too. It was like, <laughs> oh no, Tom Green, I'm going to run away. Um, but yeah, he definitely did that for the Sydney team and just continued on with the form. Um, similar to a Chad Warner, like Errol Goulden was more midfield, whereas a Chad Warner was playing midfield, but then running a lot more through to similar to, a, I'm going to say a Lockie Neal, right? Maybe not the right um, description or comparison, but someone who's playing a lot through the midfield who will run through the half forward line and try and kick goals. That's what Chad Warner was doing. And he ended up with two on the day. So if he can continue that type of role, maybe Chad Warner, I mean, I'm not going to say DPP is coming, but like Chad Warner could end up jumping up a little bit in points and obviously in price because adding that forward ability to be able to kick goals on the run means that you're going to score more in super coach versus just distributing and setting up goals for people. Yeah. Never say never. Yeah. Nah, nah, never say never. He could get it. There was no Taylor Adams today, remember? So, um, That's, that's someone who's probably going to be playing on the ball. If we can get a forward eligible Chad Warner, you know for sure this guy's going to be top six um, for us. I wouldn't yet yeah, get in my team, but not at the moment. Don't pick a player like Chad Warner for that for that elevated price point with the hope that he's going to get forward DPP. Just wait for him to get the DPP first, if he's going to get it, and then jump on him. Um, because we sort of saw a lot more midfield time coming out of Luke Parker. I thought later on in this stage of his career that this guy is going to be playing a bit more forward, but he certainly played a lot more on the ball than I anticipated. When we got him in Supercoach, obviously he came in in that first year when DPPs happened. Um, when we got him in Supercoach, it was because he was playing forward and Sydney needed a lot of help in that position. Uh I think he looks like he's taking on a little bit of that Callum Mills, I'll play wherever they need me type. And that happens with when you're older, you want to keep playing because all the young kids are very good. So you're like, hey, coach, put my hand up. Like, I want to play everywhere so I can play every week, right? Um, That's what Luke Parker's turned into a little bit. And that's what we saw from this game was he went to the back line and was kicking the ball around and helping out at half back, moved to the forward line and was helping with the transition work and things like that. So maybe it's more the ball use and not actually setting up in those positions, but he was around those positions, right? So that's kind of where I think he will end up. And maybe we get a cheeky DPP early, but Luke Parker's getting older. He's not as quick as type of player. And it is what it is with him. I think he's just going to keep playing and being like, cool, if it extends my career out for a few years by, I mean, I don't think he's 30 yet, but he's getting there. Um, if it extends my career out by a few years, being able to be like played in different spots and offer that leadership and toughness, then, then he'll do that. And we're slowly seeing that as a player now. Yeah, but if he gets forward eligibility, oh, then he's top six forward. Again, he becomes a top six forward. So these are yeah. these are the types of players that we that we really want to monitor during the course of the season. Um, and he's gone. He's had forward eligibility in the past, so they've got a lot more mids now yeah. going through that midfield yeah. group. So you never know. He could get that forward eligibility. Um, someone who mm-hmm. won't get DPP um, is this guy because he was by far and away the number one ruckman playing in that role that we all know and love and what we hope to see from Brody Grundy. And he started the game like a house on fire. He had a point to prove. He had a chip on his shoulder. Um, He was probably itching to play because he hardly played at the back half of the year for Melbourne last Mm. year as well. So, uh, hey, Brody Grundy, he's a lock, man. He's a a fat lock. Yeah. Like, we we spoke about it with the the Briggs one as well, where, hey – he was versing Briggs and Briggs kind of pushed him around a little bit at the start. But as you say, Joe, Brody Grundy has a point to prove. Like Brody Grundy is going to play and he's going to do the best that he can do. And he's going to show at least the GW, oh, sorry, the, at least the Sydney fans, like this is why you took on my big contract. This is why you brought me across. It's going to be fantastic. He does not want to be relegated to VFL anymore. He, he's VFL Grundy. He's done. Like put an X through VFL Grundy. It's not happening again. 
Exactly, exactly. And and even though he might not he might not necessarily, if he's up against a big ruckman like a Briggs type, for example, he can still shine on the day because this guy acts like an extra midfielder at ground level, unlike a Briggs, uh, unlike a Wits. He's a very mobile player, Brody Grundy. He's like an extra midfielder, and they love the way that the way they like to use the ball. The Swans, he'll fit right in. Um, yeah. This guy, there is a there is a, a saying. I dream of Heaney. Are we dreaming of Heaney again? He's playing around oh, the ball. There's always been I, these whispers that he's going to play midfield. He's going to have midfield time. He had midfield time today. I um I, I mentioned it with Riley with um Riles Macker. And I was just like, are we going to get sucked in like George every year and just pick Heaney and just be like, cool, he's going to let us down. And yes, they're trying to set him up so he can do more of those things. But I think he's still going to play majority forward. When the time crunch happens, when some of the other forwards aren't working as well, he's going to go forward and he's going to kick goals. So preseason intra clubs, maybe it's like, cool. You, you know, when you're a kid and like you get all your sugar at lunchtime, so at nighttime you can go to bed. Maybe that's like the same with Heaney. Give him all the mid-time now so during the season we don't have to give him mid-time and he's still happy because he played mid at some point in the season. Oh, my that, God. That's kind of what, what it's felt like a little bit. Um, we'll see what happens, but as a super coach selection, you, you're not starting him because of the early buy. Um, so maybe someone just to monitor if you're really keen. Like if we've got no DPPs, Heaney could end up being a top six. And that's really scary, Joe. He looks good. I know. That's the thing. The problem is he actually looked good. It's not just that he had the role, but he looked good at it. That's the I crazy don't thing. I, I don't, I don't. Want to. Let's stop talking about him because we might suck ourselves in. Oh. Are you more keen on this guy having watched the game or less keen? I think it was a good... James Jordan definitely showed me where he was going to play. And I, maybe not more keen or less keen, but giving you that knowledge of, hey, this is where I'm going to be. This is the role and stuff I'm going to have. So being able to shore that idea in your head definitely cut out some of the, the worries. Um, he played inside me. He played wing. He was used as that transition mold. It felt like at Melbourne he was more wing half forward, which resulted in a few more poor scores. But James Jordan was playing wing contested. And it looks like from... Riles Macker, I'll go again, and just kind of what Sydney need in general, not having a lot of contested players, that he could have a role getting a few CBAs and then being out on the wing in other games, just depending on who else is lining up at the midfield at that time. Maybe his second rotation pure mid and then plays the wing for the rest of the time, fantastic, because he was being used as that transition player, similar to a weir at GWS. He was being used as that player who can run, because he can run and he can pass and do those things. So, yeah, he looked all right for the price potentially on my list for the next two games, depending on how Fife or someone goes. For me, he's not. You? For me, he's no? not on my list. For me, oh. um, I don't want to spend almost $300,000 for a winger. I, I, he looked good there. That's the thing. No he looked available. good. He filled, he filled the role really well. He played it really well. And he mm. could make the money. Um, I think he's that good that he could make the money despite despite it being a wing role. But for me, I I don't know. I'd, I'd rather go cheaper. I think um, okay. and goes and go for some rookies because like, he he might go 75, 80, um, playing on a wing, which is fine. But I feel like I can use the money better maybe in the midfield or in the back line with perhaps like a Lazaro in his place or maybe a Harms yeah. or a Billings. Um, with the news, of course, with. Angus Brayshaw retiring, I think oh, yeah, it could definitely. mean it could mean more stonks for Billings, perhaps um, at that early at that lower price point. Could be saving myself around fifty thousand dollars by picking a Billings instead of a Jordan. So um, I'm more likely not to start Jordan now, but of course, always open to be convinced otherwise based on the next two games. Well, that's it, right? And as you say, as I kind of alluded to, if there's better options. I'll probably pick the better options, but at least it shows us and, and confirms, hey, this is where he's going to be playing. So that's always good for us in Supercoach to kind of have that knowledge. And with that, guys, that it was our discussion of the Battle of the Bridge preseason practice game between the Sydney Swans and the GWS Giants, where the Swans got the dub um, fairly comfortably against the Giants. We hope you enjoyed our breakdown today. Let us know in the chat, hey, 
Were you looking at any of these players? Big J, I told you about we all these guys that they're going to do really well. Let us know down in the comments. Or did we kind of show you that some of these guys are available and there might actually be some options outside of your generic players to choose this year? Exactly. And let me know, guys, if I'm being a bit too harsh on James Jordan uh, <laughs> as a player. <laughs> if, you know, you, 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 what, what are you talking about, bro? James Jordan looks good. Yes, yes, he looks great. Uh, if you like what you saw here today, please drop us a subscription. Would greatly help the growth of the channel. Hit a like as well if you sort of liked what we had to talk about today. And hit that notification bell to make sure that you don't miss out on any of the content that we are continuously pumping out. Remember, guys, we've got our Super Coach League as well. I think we're up to about 300 odd players. So it's definitely growing. Jump on it. You guys can win a jersey. You can win two tickets to the AFL or an AFL voucher where you can buy what you want from the store. But wait, but wait, there's more. We've also recently opened up our very first tipping competition on the AFL website. Um, the description to the link as well as the competition code will also be provided down below for you guys to join that. Uh, the winner of the tipping competition gets themselves a $50 AFL store voucher. So head on over and try and join not only the league but for Supercoach, but also our tipping where we will be going through the results uh, during our Monday night live streams. Joe, our fans, our members, our community, they can get all this free stuff. I, I wish I had that when I was like, cool, not making content. Just come on, get all this free stuff. Guys, we've got lots coming out, going through all the teams, all the games. Here at the Centre Bounce, we do the hard work. See you. For now.